Brilliant. Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar looking at how to build a disability inclusive workplace. Um, just firstly, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, and if you have any questions throughout the session, please pop them in the Q&A functionality just down there. Um, so without further ado, I'm pleased to welcome Lizzie Green, a digital inclusion consultant at AbilityNet, to tell you a little bit more about inclusive workplace practices. Welcome, Lizzie. Brilliant. Thank you, Ellie. That's the bit where I have to remember to unmute myself. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm really, really happy to um, to be here. As Ellie said, my name is Lizzie Green and I am a digital inclusion consultant um, at AbilityNet. Um, I've been working with AbilityNet since uh, 2016 um, and I've worked my way up through the levels of our team here um, and I'm now responsible for uh, developing and delivering uh, workplace inclusion consultants to a huge range of our clients across all of our sectors um, and also worth a mention for a session like today so I also spent a large amount of time working as AbilityNet's administration manager which gave me a huge wealth of experience leading multiple teams across our organisation here um, and I'm also super passionate about assistive technology being widely available and easily accessible for all so I like to talk a lot about things that are already there that we can use um, and also free things that are available to us as well. So just a few bits of housekeeping from, uh, from me on top of what Ellie has already mentioned. I do just always like to mention that we are on Zoom today and captions are available should you require them. And um, you can toggle these on and off yourself, depending on what platform you have joined on in Zoom, that will either be hovering somewhere around the bottom or the top of your screen. They might be hidden under the more section as well, but you should be able to find captions if you need to. And also during the session today, we're going to be asking, uh, inviting you to reflect on your own inclusive practices at your organisation, and we will be using Slido's for this. Um, so they're used for the interactive questions. Um, you will see a QR code when we get to the first Slido. So if you do have a mobile device available, you can scan that QR code. Alternatively, you can join on the web with a code. Um, and if you aren't able to access the Slido's, that's absolutely not a problem at all. Like I said, it's a, just an opportunity to reflect as to where you are in your organisation organization so if you just want to think about it and not participate in the slidos that's absolutely fine too Okay, so before I start, I just want to give you a very brief introduction to AbilityNet for those who haven't heard of us before. So we are a charity whose vision is a digital world accessible to all. Um, and we work towards this vision with a wide range of activities. So these include services for organisations to help them create um, accessible and inclusive customer employee experiences. And um, we also have some popular services that include consultancy training and support services for digital accessibility. Um, we also look at workplace and education inclusion as well. And then also all of this uh, paid work goes to funding our uh, AbilityNet volunteers. We are now rapidly approaching 400 volunteers across the whole of the UK who go and offer in help, help um, and support with any tech for anybody who is elderly or disabled. So uh, really proud of that team and what they do. So just a quick uh, look over what we're going to be uh, covering today. We do just have an hour and we have uh, quite a lot to get through. So I do really want this to be um, an interactive session with you though. So again, please do use those slidos for interaction um, as we go through. If you do have any questions, as um, Ellie said, please do pop those in the Q&A. We'll try and get through as many as I can. And if there are a lot of questions, I'm not able to get to all of them in the short session today, then I will take those away and do a follow up that um, can be circulated afterwards as well. Um, so we'll be looking at why building a disability inclusive workplace is important. We'll look at how you can evaluate, evaluate your own workplace for accessibility and conclusion. Uh, we'll work together using those slidos to set those benchmarks of where you think you are and have a think about where you can go next. Um, we'll talk a little bit about identifying and overcoming some common barriers and implementing some change into your work. Uh, practices and lastly we'll talk about suggested ways that you can move forward um, and think about what you can do after this session okay so why is it why is it important to develop that disability inclusive culture in your workplace so there is a legal case 
So um, you do have a legal obligation under the Equality Act of 2010 to make reasonable adjustments to support people identifying with any of the nine protective characteristics. And these are age, race, gender, sexual orientation, disability, religion or belief, gender reassignment, pregnancy and maternity, and partnership and marriage. So obviously today we are focusing on disability, which in itself is a really broad category um, that can affect a high number of staff in each workplace and with a high likelihood of intersectional with uh, some of those other characteristics too. Um, so there is that legal um, duty also for organisations to provide um, accessible digital experiences and this is under the public sector regulations for accessibility which affects public sector bodies um, and also anybody supplying to the public sector. So there's also a moral case. So quite simply, it's the right thing to do. 80% of disabled people. So uh, we can say there is a quote that is disability is an open club and anybody can join. Um, so you want your workplace to be ready to provide necessary support. Um, beyond this, people increasingly value how other people are treated and represented in their company, regardless of their own situation. So th there is a real high value attached to that inclusive culture by most employees. And lastly, there's a really strong business case for getting this right. So there was a study by Accenture that said that organisations that prioritise disability inclusion had on average 28% higher revenue, 100% higher net income, 30% higher economic profit margins, and a 200% increased likelihood of outperforming their peers in total shareholder returns. Uh, so hopefully that should be enough to convince any of those doubters. So I just wanted to take time to have a quick look at the definitions of disability as well. So under that Equality Act of 2010, the definition of disability is a physical or mental condition which has substantial or long term impact on your ability to do normal day to day activities. So while this is a useful definition for the purposes of identifying against discrimination, it does feel quite deficit focused. So we prefer to champion the social model of disability, which places that focus on people being disabled by barriers in society rather than their health condition or impairment. Um, so these barriers could be at work, in education and in their day-to-day -day life. So when we talk about barriers, these barriers can be physical, so things like access design and suitability of physical spaces. They could be digital or practical in terms of accessibility of web applications um, or the ease of being able to carry out working processes. And they could be cultural and linked to people's attitudes and beliefs about differences in disabled people's abilities. Um, so in our experience, where there is a will, there is a way. Um, but identifying the barriers and being flexible and creative um, is in the vast majority of cases possible to remove these barriers and allow everyone to participate and engage with just a few changes um, or just thinking a bit differently about our experiences. OK, so now we're going to have a quick look at the employee journey. Um, so on the slide here, we have an employee journey. So in design, people look at user journeys, and that's really helpful um, to use to look at the employee journey um, and help you do a more detailed evaluation of your processes. Um, so the experience of inclusion for employees needs to be consistent. It needs to have an organisational wide reach, and it needs to be considered at every stage of the employee life cycle. Um, so progress towards this needs to be treated as any other business objective would. So it needs to be measured, there needs to be targets set and the progress needs to be reviewed regularly. Um, so we have the journey here that starts at recruitment, it moves on to onboarding, teamwork and collaboration, meetings and events, performance and career development and customer facing. Um, so today, today we're going to have a look specifically at the recruitment, onboarding and teamwork in today's session. But you might also want to be thinking about meetings and events, performance and career development, um, and then look outwards to customer facing too, if that's something that comes into your organisation. Uh, but we're just going to focus in on those first three in today's session. 
So um, building inclusive practices is, is a process um, and all organizations are going to be at one stage or another in this process. Um, and to demonstrate the process of the stages, we use an analogy of acorns growing into oak trees. So what we're going to do for recruitment, onboarding and teamwork is I'm going to read out some statements um, from um, oak, acorn to oak tree against each of those uh, sections. Then when I've read out the statements, I'm going to invite you to use the Slido to say where you think you might be um, in your organization, um, your team, if you are easier place to answer based on your team rather than your organization as a whole, to see where you are. And then we'll go on to look at some tips of how we can improve in those areas areas. So the first stop is recruitment. Uh, so clearly a really important element in attracting and successfully recruiting a diverse team. So I'll read through these, very, um, these statements and as I'm doing that have a think about where you think you are so you can vote on the next slide. So uh, we have the acorn. So this is a one size fits all approach to recruitment. We haven't considered accessibility or disability inclusion. Uh, so although some hiring team members individually might have relevant knowledge to support disabled candidates, it's a real luck of the draw as to whether the con candidate will have a positive experience um, and they could actually be put off before even applying. Then we have the seedling. So we invite people to disclose a disability or other characteristic and tell us if they have support needs for the interview. So this stage is better, but it's not going to necessarily work as many candidates might be reluctant to ask for uh, adjustments for fear of judgment or standing out from the crowd. We then move on to the sapling. So we proactively welcome applications from disabled candidates and communicate interview adjustments available upon disclosure of need. We may have alternative hiring programs that are targeted to certain audiences and we proactively advertise as such. So this one's really positive and it's going to make it much more likely that a disabled candidate might apply and take up opportunities to adapt the process to meet their needs. But again, it still does rely a little bit on disclosing that disability. And then we have the oak tree. So we offer flexibility and support with application and interview processes to everyone. And we proactively invite candidates to tell us about anything additional that could help them perform at their best. So we offer a range of methods uh, and apply um, to apply for roles. So this is really great. Everyone can benefit, but it also recognizes that at that tree stage, you're still open to the candidates um, actively telling you about anything additional that you can carry on to, to learn. So onto our first Slido vote. So as I mentioned there, you have the QR code that you can scan there, or you can join at uh, slido.com. And then for this session, you'll need to enter the code, which is uh, 364. 0 to 0. So what stage of building inclusive and accessible recruitment do you think you are at at the moment? And I can see some votes coming in so far. So I'll just give you a minute to get onto the Slido. Okay, I like seeing the bars moving around, although I always just go to read them out and they, they shift on me again. Just wait for it to settle down. I've had quite a few votes in so far. So at the moment, we're looking at seedling as the top market there. It's around 57% at the moment with the sapling at 30. We have some acorns at 13 and no one going for the oak tree at this stage. So that's great. Um, seedling, sapling, um, great stages to be at. It means that you started thinking about your, um, your processes, hopefully starting to implement some of those things. Um, acorns, absolutely no problem at all. Hopefully we'll, you'll pick up some takeaways from the session uh, today to start going away and thinking about how you can move on in your journey. Okay. 
So some evaluation points for uh, recruitment and that we drill down into, into our, in our full gap analysis um, session, we focus in on accessibility and inclusivity of things like the job adverts and the application process. So this is checking for things like the accessibility of the documents that you're sharing and the application process itself. Uh, we also look at the content and the language of those applications too. We look at shortlisting, uh, so avoiding bias or sifting out great candidates for the wrong reasons. Um, we look at the pre-interview and the interview, so providing that warm welcome via a scheduling process or setting it up so that everyone is able to perform at their best in their interview. Okay, and one of our top tips uh, from our how to uh, develop inclusive and accessible recruitment sessions is to check the different formats you use for job adverts and applications to see whether they are accessible. So you need to think about a few different areas here. You need to think about your website, the job advert itself and the application uh, process, but also think about any associated resources such as recruitment based videos and things that you might use. Um, so we can do this by making sure that all the formats that we use are accessible. So we can use accessibility checkers to check our documents and web pages. Um, you should think about following the WCAG, so the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, and if you are unsure about uh, this, then we do have a blog on our website as to why it's important. Um, so if our website, I'll share it in the chat at the end, is abilitynet.org.uk. Um, we have lots of blogs, uh, news pages and free resources on there, but there's one specifically about those guidelines and why we should follow them. Um, so for think about if we were using forms, so um, an inaccessible form might risk many potential candidates abandoning their application before they even get through it uh, when a form is not accessibility checked. Um, Listening to the questions or finding the text fields to type in the answers can become really confusing and frustrating for someone who might be using something like a screen reader to read the screen out to you. Um, typically, the most accessible option here is HTML for web page forms, but again, you do need to make sure you're following those WCAG guidelines to make it fully accessible. Um, you can check the access of your forms using keyboard navigation. Um, there is a, a Windows narrator um, which is a free built into your Windows machine narration, which will read out everything on your screen for you. Um, so sometimes it can be really interesting to pop that on and uh, see where the cursor lands, so to speak, when you start listening to your content on your page. Um, just some common uh, keyboard shortcuts that you can use. So you use the tab key to move through all the shortcuts on your keyboard and shift and tab to move backwards. Um, it's really nice as well just to go on to a site and start playing with the tab key and just see if the information tabs across the page in the right order because if it doesn't uh, you need to think about someone who might be using a screen reader they do generally use those tabs to navigate through the page so if everything's being read out to them in a, um, a different order it's going to be quite confusing for them to know where they are um, so you might want to consider using things like easy read documents for job applications um, or job descriptions. Um, so there is UK government guidance on um, easy read documents on the government website, um, but an easy read document uses simplified languages and images that not only help individuals with cognitive and learning disabilities, but also can be really helpful for people where English might be their second language. And if you include videos to highlight your organisation or a job role in spe uh, specific job role, then look at how accessible it is. Does it include captions or is there a transcript available? Um, so again, you can learn more about accessible videos in an AbilityNet training session that we have about how to produce accessible videos too. And finally, do you normalise asking for help? Um, so you could do this by having a prominent request help link, um, ideally with some named contacts. Um, you know, frame requests as help um, as a means to gaining feedback on how you might improve your overall process for everyone. Um, so you might um, be able to offer alternatives as well, such as telephone or text communication. Um, so you might default to a digital first attitude, but you do risk excluding people who have um, barriers where the fundamental barrier is accessing those help links on uh, a digital 
digital platform in the first place. Um, so this feedback is really crucial because without it, um, you won't know what people need um, and they won't be able to contact you. And if they can't contact you, that you don't know that they are having a problem. Okay. Uh, so next we'll move on to onboarding. So again, I'm going to read out these statements from the grid that relate to onboarding um, and have a think about where you think you are as an organization or a team uh, when it comes to onboarding. So uh, we start with the ACORN. So we don't really have an onboarding process as such. People just need to get stuck in. Um, so this is definitely going to be challenging for most people, uh, regardless of a disability or not. We then have seedling. So we have processes for joiners that are standardized and if it doesn't work for someone they need to tell their line manager and we will see what can be done to help so this is better but it does still mean that you have to come forward and some people might feel worried about standing out or being a nuisance especially if they've just started at an organization we then have sapling uh, so we have comprehensive onboarding process that includes workstation setup training and orientation Ability adjustments uh, can be chosen from a comprehensive range. So this is much better and it does show that you've thought about normalizing that asking for support. And then at the oak tree, we have comprehensive onboarding processes that are generated to uh, geared to meet the widest possible needs of starters. Uh, options are available for workstations, software and flexible working to make sure everyone can get up and running in a way that suits them. If there is something different that someone needs, we make it easy to communicate and arrange. Um, so this is really expanding those opportunities for working in the way that suits you um, and not a way that suits everyone in the whole organisation. OK, so on to the next Slido. So what stage of building inclusive and accessible onboarding are you at at the moment? So if you do have the Slido open, it should stay open on your phone. But otherwise, that QR code is back there for you to join. We have those votes coming in. Okay. So they are still jumping a little bit, but I think we're nearly, they have settled slightly. So in this one, we have sapling coming through with 52%, 41% at seedling, 7% at the acorn, and uh, again, oak tree. Um, at the zero there so yeah again great a lot a huge percentage of you are already somewhere on your journey so you've already started thinking about these things um, and yet yeah, hopefully look at some ideas for moving those forward so great thank you um, so in our onboarding session um, the evaluation points that we drill into uh, in our full gap analysis section um, are um, thinking about a pre-arrival so preparing every with everything needed before someone even starts working at your organization. We look at workstation setups. Um, so this is for success, for comfort and for productivity. Uh, so we look at that welcome. So your introductions, um, getting the lowdown on the organization, getting an idea of what is important. Um, then we touch on upskilling and training, so providing quality upskilling to suit all of the different types of learners that you might have. Okay, so AbilityNet are a technology charity and there is a huge array of tech available to help people work independently and comfortably. So there are many tools that are available that have multiple benefits for people um, with visual, hearing, cognitive and motor or physical impairments. And the range of assistive tech technology tools uh, can be free and low cost and then there also is all of that uh, great specialist technology too. Um, so in this section we just like to point out some of the things that are available to you for low cost that you can get started on straight away. Um, so we have My Computer My Way which is an AbilityNet de developed tool that we're really super proud of. Um, 
it, there's a huge team that go into putting a lot of work and effort into uh, my computer my way. So this offers you um, step by step guides and instructions on how to adapt your phone, your computer or your tablet to meet your needs. So you can search for things based on a specific need. For example, if you wanted to make the text larger, um, you could filter your guides based on your symptoms. So if you had a hand tremor, for example, or on a condition that you know you have something like dyslexia. And these guidelines are going to bring you up everything that your computer, tablet, phone, already has built into its settings to help you. Um, so it's going to tell you about um, how to make those texts larger, how to change the colors on your screen, how to put color filters on there. Um, it tells you about um, talkbacks and read alouds um, that are all built in. Um, and it just tells you exactly where you where you need to find them, exactly where you need to go. So it will give you a quick guide if you are a bit more familiar with the text with how to find it, but also gives you a breakdown into those step by step guides that have pictures as well of where you need to go in um, your different browsers, your different uh, operating systems. The newest version of My Computer My Way as well will also let you know what operating system you are running on the machine that you're using. If you don't know um, what you're currently running, it will auto select it for you. Um, and it's just a huge database of everything that is available that you can turn on. Um, I do always give a slight caveat when I'm talking on sessions like these to say that um, in some of the bigger organizations historically, we have found that um, some people's IT departments sometimes do have a lockdown on the accessibility features on your machine. Um, so you may need to work with IT to get those unlocked, but if there is something on your machine that is there that you need to use, then this would be seen as a reasonable adjustment and should come above any IT policies, but you might need to check in with them. Um, we also, as I've already mentioned once already in the session, have AbilityNet's fact sheets. So these are free to download um, and they provide advice and information on how computers and other technologies can help people with a range of conditions and impairments. So they're written by our specialist team of assessors and accessibility consultants, and they give really detailed information about a wide range of assistive technologies, services, and other related organizations that might be able to help with specific um, conditions or impairments. Um, also, many of them do help to give those step-by-step -step guides on setting up computer or software, um, especially those assistive softwares to meet individual requirements. Uh, so these are a really nice start point. Um, if, for instance, you have someone who is maybe starting at your organization that has shared a condition with you and you don't know much information about the condition that they do have, our fact sheets are a new, really nice place to go to, to start having a read through some information, possibly pick up some useful um, tips that you might be able to share with your new starter. Um, obviously though, what we always say is quite often the person that you're working with, they're gonna be the expert um, in their condition. They're gonna know how they've been living with it currently, what they need. So they're definitely an expert resource that you do want to tap into, but our fact sheets and information can give you a little bit of info to help you along the way too. Okay, so next, moving on to teamwork and collaboration. So again, I'll read out these uh, statements and then we'll have a little bit of a vote. Uh, so we have ACORN. So there isn't anything formalized around accessibility um, inclusive collaborations. I don't know if tools and processes are accessible or not. Uh, we just go with the majority viewpoints when decision making. So this scenario is likely pre to present some barriers for some individuals um, and also unlikely to encourage all the team members to express their own opinions and inputs freely. We then have seedling. So we have some set collaboration tools and processes, and we are aware, aware that people might need some adjustments, uh, but we deal with this on a case by case basis. We mostly go around the table to make sure everyone agrees with decisions. Uh, this is better, but the onus is still heavily on those individuals to request those changes to the way that things are done or uh, raise a challenge to a widely held viewpoint of others. Then we have sapling. Uh, so we have set 
collaboration tools and processes that seek to consider the needs of disabled colleagues. We make the efforts to procure accessible tools. Uh, we check if people require adjustments and offer a range of different ways to overcome barriers. We make sure all voices are heard when decision making. So this is great and it means that the disabled colleagues are able to rely on the fact that the tools will hopefully be accessible um, and they can access adjustments as needed and they are given that uh, chance to input their views on decision making early on in processes. Then we have the tree. So we have a coherent approach to collaboration that makes use of an agreed set of tools and processes, but it's open to considering new and creative approaches. We approach collaboration by aiming to make it inclusive by design, but also a safe space to disagree and brainstorm. We set housekeeping rules to exclude participants, um, including participants, sorry, <laughs> um, and offer flexibility to everyone. Um, so this is a great place to be as that confirmed set of housekeeping rules and those tools and processes that are checked for accessibility. But we also show that there is that openness to look at new ways of doing things, um, trying to avoid getting entrenched in that this is how we've always done things kind of mentality. Um, there's also an invitation there to uh, challenge and to kick around um, ideas and thoughts for decision making, but also gives that psychological safety that you will not be judged for offering an opposing position um, and that others won't take offence to what you are saying. Okay, and again, um, pop the slido up here. So what stage of building an inclusive and accessible teamwork and collaboration do we think we're at at the moment? And thank you very much, Ellie. I've just checked the chat and seen that you've been sharing those links to um, my computer my way. Thank you very much. OK, so we're settling down on this boat. Oh, no. A few more coming in. OK. So we have a little bit more of a, a mix across the board on this one, which is uh, great to see. So we have seedling and sapling currently tied with 34% each. We have 17% at acorn and we have 14% at oak tree, which is fantastic to see that some of you are at that stage already. Uh, as we say, uh, we like to use the analogy of an oak tree because trees never stop growing. So um, there's always opportunity for us to to do more, um, especially when it comes to the world of tech. Uh, working for a technology charity, I'm very aware of the landscape constantly changing um, and the need to try and keep up with that as much as possible. OK. So thanks for all your votes. Um, so again, the evaluation points that we drill into in our full gap analysis for teamwork um, focus on accessibility and inclusivity of your interaction and participation. Um, so looking at things like input for all without barriers, um, and we talk about the ways that this can be achieved. Um, we look at those platforms and tools. Um, are they accessible and are they useful? Um, I definitely had a chat with Ellie before this session started about um, Zoom versus Teams. I said to uh, her, and I'll say it again here, both have fantastic accessibility features, both have some that could be improved on, um, but they're all different. So um, it's really important to try and look at what features are included in each platform and tool and what might be useful for you. Um, and even if you can, having the options to change platforms and use different platforms if required. Um, I know not possible in some organisations that buy into a one tool only, but it is a really helpful um, accessibility thing if you can have more than one available to you. 
Um, we also look at policy and culture. Um, so we look at whether this is inclusive and respectful to create those conditions for positively challenging and debating. Again, we mentioned that psychological safety, feeling that you are able to challenge something um, without being uh, judged or viewed uh, in a negative way by your peers um, and colleagues and the wider organisation. Okay, so again, um, we all use a wealth of tools and platforms to help facilitate collaboration, um, but how do we know if they're designed to meet the needs of all the users? Um, so I love this quote that we have from Jenny Leigh Flurry. She's the Chief Accessibility Offer, Officer at Microsoft, and she says, if you don't know how accessible you are, you're not. Um, and I, I do love that um, that quote is something that I use quite regularly. So if you aren't sure about your tools, um, you can immediately assume that there's likely to probably be some issues there. Um, so again, there's a number of ways that you can check if your tools are accessible. Um, so again, we can look at those WCAG, those Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So those sets of guidelines um, state what's necessary for improving web accessibility. Um, the guidelines are put together by the W3C, which is the World Wide Web Consortium. And they really are the best way to make sure that a website is accessible for all of your users. Um, there's three different stages of compliance at WCAG, which you might see mentioned. So at the lowest level, they start at A. So you have level A, level double A, and level triple A. So triple A is the highest and A is the base level. Um, to achieve triple A status, you have to uh, tick off everything in the A standard and the AA standard, as well as the extras in the AAA. And generally speaking, at AbilityNet, when we do um, auditing and checking of websites, uh, we're looking to reach at least a AA standard. Um, so that's just a little bit of technical information. Don't worry too much about that, but do go check out those guidelines if um, web is something that you look at regularly. You can also look at whether there is an accessibility statement or a VPAT that you can review. Um, this is especially useful if you are um, procuring uh, systems that are from somebody else. So a VPAT is a voluntary product accessibility template. Um, so it's a voluntary document that explains how information and communication technology, so ICT products such as software, hardware, electronic content, and support documentations meet accessibility requirements. Um, and it warns users about any accessibility blockers that they might encounter. So as I say, this is a voluntary statement um, that organizations can put out about their software. Um, so you should also check the accessibility of what they're saying yourselves too, if you are procuring. But if you are going through some procurement, um, you can ask if they do have an accessibility statement or a VPAT, uh, because if they do have one of them, then it's likely that at least you know that that organization has accessibility on its mind. It's thinking about what they can do. They have looked at their products um, themselves to put forward this uh, VPAT or statement. Um, again, they might not have used an organization to fully check the accessibility. So you still want to look at having those checks, but it's a really good start point and something that you can be asking for from the beginning. Um, so also when procuring new digital platforms, it's really nice to be able to check the user's journey. So um, think about any tools that you might be able to to use to test them. So you want to, again, try and maybe have a go and seeing if they're accessible for those keyboard only users and screen reader users. So as I mentioned, that tab key and the shift tab to move forwards and backwards is a really good start point to just start having a test out. Um, you need to see if you can try and customize content to make sure that it's possible to do things like um, enlarging any text on the screen and um, changing color contrasts on screen to make things easier for people. Um, and also remember those things like the use of captions if you are looking at video content too. Um, and provide ways to feedback. So as we mentioned before, this is really important. 
And if we can try and provide more than one way to feedback, so giving people the option of um, verbal, so maybe a telephone number, email, um, if you maybe have some chat functions or surveys, this way you can constantly be trying to improve or trying to find alternative ways to collaborate that's inclusive. And as we said before, um, it's really important to make it feel like that feedback is really important to you and that people aren't um, causing trouble or being a nuisance if they're feeding back. So it's really important to, um, to request that feedback in a really positive light to have it work towards your own improvements. Okay, so how to move forward. So, um, as we said, evaluating your employee journey in detail to find the gaps. So a little bit like we have been doing today with asking people to vote on where they're at. Um, so we do do um, AbilityNet as well as series of detailed questionnaires that can uh, gather the current state of play within your organization. And you can engage your teams in, the pro in your process. So um, your team might have the answers already. So don't rely on just one version of the truth. You know, look to work outside of that bubble. So we recommend that you gather a really wide range of viewpoints across your organization to get a true picture um, of what it's like, um, especially if you're thinking about what might be policy versus reality. Um, so you may have all these policies in place. But it's a really good idea to speak to a wide range of people across your organization to see if the reality is that those policies are being used in practice. Um, so it's really important as well to prioritize based on effort versus impact. So what we mean by this is don't try and go and make all those changes in one go. And um, it might be a really good idea to start with some of the things that you can really simply put in place. So looking at things like my computer, my way, just advertising those to your staff and um, saying these are all the things that might be available on your machine already. Go away and have a look and see if you can put any of those in place and, um, you know, tackle things one thing at a time. Um, just by trying and starting to make those changes, it's going to be really encouraging for people, especially if you potentially have people within your organisation that have a condition or a disability that they haven't shared with you. If you start proactively advertising these things, proactively talking about change around disability and inclusion, hopefully that's going to make them feel a little bit more confident to come forward and to be able to share with you and to help you on that journey and to give their own viewpoint of things that might be helpful for them and develop your skills across the team so try and provide training and resources and reference materials to help everyone be able to play that part so the broader you can go with the basics the less onerous this becomes um, and if people know why then things don't need to escalate so what we mean by this is it's really important to make sure that everyone is aware of why you are doing these things quite often we see with accessibility it can often rely on a group of people who are really good champions for accessibility and they really struggle to get the rest of the organization on board and um, if we do awareness training and we develop skills of everybody in our team so they know the why's of the reasons that we're doing these things and um, it can be easier to get them on board and um, again I mentioned to Ellie before the session a favorite thing that I like to do um, and what she said she's done with some colleagues is um, we tell them about things that are accessibility features but also help them um, Ellie mentioned that she uh, spoke to some team members who were making notes in a meeting and she said why don't you turn the transcript on that's in um, in teams when you have a meeting because the transcript will then just record everything for you um, and it's doing things like that it's showing people that by turning on an accessibility feature we can help everybody we can make everybody's lives easier we can get them some uh, to buy into doing those things which are then going to be really helpful for them but also going to be really helpful to have in there as an accessibility and inclusion feature too um, so a lot of these tools can be helpful for a lot of people um, but make sure we're getting as many people as involved as possible so it all just doesn't come down and rely on that one person champion in this champion championing that's that was a difficult one to get out this afternoon um change okay so what might be stopping you so again um 
some of these might resonate with some people on the call today. So um, environment. So do the physical aspects feel uncertain or out of reach? Uh, so things like signs, doorways, steps, chairs and desks in a physical environment. Um, then the culture. So there might be an opposing culture in your organisation. Um, and we understand that this can sometimes make things really difficult to shift. And um, the knowledge and the skills. So there might just be a lack of understanding or skills, um, a lack of disability awareness and uh, not knowing about that inclusive language. And we like to say that it's an idea of um, don't be scared to get it wrong, um, but correct through engagement with your staff and through your training, but also harbour an environment of, you know, it's, it's OK if you get it wrong. If you get it wrong, just, you know, accept someone telling you that you've got it wrong and learn how to do it correctly the next time. But we really also don't want people to be too scared to say anything because they're scared of saying the wrong thing. Um, finances. Uh, so a lot of people think that accessibility is going to be really expensive and they don't have the finances to do this, but not all ad adaptations are expensive. And as we've mentioned already, some of them are free or relatively low cost. And um, some are also government funded. So there is the access to work scheme from the government. Um, again, we have a fact sheet on our website about the access to work scheme if you wanted to find out more about that. Um, and this was um, from a study which was in the US, uh, but I think it's relevant for this country as well to say that 59% of reasonable adjustments cost nothing. Um, so that was from a US job accommodation network study. And again, although it was in the US, I would hazard to say that it was a similar, if not higher number in the UK too. Um, and then we, we get to the practicalities. So again, a uh, reasonable adjustment. So what is the definition of a reasonable adjustment? Um, so there's always a bit of a gray area about what is actually included in a reasonable adjustment. Um, but it's about looking at those alternatives as well and just being able to offer something as an alternative for people. Um, and then the digital. So, um, you know, is it accessible? Have you checked your website? Have you checked the shared information? Um, your documents, your applications that team members are expected to use. So we do understand that this can sometimes feel like a huge project as well. If you have lots of existing platforms, documents and applications that you've been using for a very long time. Um, but as we mentioned on the previous slide, it's about taking things one step at a time, um, tackling one thing at a time um, and just working your way through to try and build in this inclusive practice from the beginning. But definitely thinking about if you're adding anything new, um, accessible by design is always preferable to trying to fit in accessibility afterwards. So if you are thinking about new projects, new documents, uh, new softwares, then it's really important to start thinking about accessibility from day one, uh, because if we can design it in, it's a much easier job than trying to change it afterwards. Okay. So just a few bits about how AbilityNet can help um, before I've timed this almost fantastically because I wanted to leave about 10 minutes at the end for questions. So um, AbilityNet do offer an in-depth gap analysis process for your organisation. Um, so again, uh, we can look at all of your inclusive working practices covering that whole uh, employee journey. Um, we have for the free resources that I've already mentioned. So we have our fact sheets and our My Computer My Way. Um, also, we do have a helpline. There's an 0800 number on our website. We have advice and information officers who are there to help if you have a specific case that you want to talk about, if you have a specific employee in mind and you needed some more information about what might be able to help them, please do reach out to our helpline and speak to one of our advice officers. Um, we run regular webinars covering loads of different themes of accessibility and inclusion. Um, the best way to keep on top of those is to sign up for our mailing list if you haven't already done so. Then you'll get regular updates about the webinars that we have coming up in case anything um, is of interest to you. Um, and then we have advice on the digital accessibility, so how to make your content and your platforms accessible, um, which is what our accessibility consultants work with uh, day in, day out. Um, 
I do just want to offer you all as well um, a discount code on any future AbilityNet online training courses that you might see online that you're interested in. So there is AbilityNet 10, which will give you a 10% discount. And there's the link there to our training. Um, so I am going to get a copy of these slides over to Ellie so she can share those out with all the delegates too for all of the links that are in um, these slides and the information. So um, please don't worry about that. We will get a copy of those to you as as well. Um, so just a summary here of what we've had a look at today. So, you know, every organisation has that potential to be inclusive um, and to look at it as a business objective is really important. Um, being realistic about that need for engagement at all levels and to note that it does re require some strategy, skills development and those regular updates to keep on top of it. And remember to set those ambitious goals, uh, but to focus on those incremental improvements and just tackling things one thing at a time. Okay, so I'm just going to leave these details up here while I take um, any and have a look at any questions. So this is just the information and contact details for our workplace relationship manager, um, whose name is Helen. So if you did want to have any further chats with AbilityNet about your specific journey into accessibility, um, please do reach out. There's also forms on our website you can fill in. Um, so I'm going to open up the questions now and see if we've had anything through. But if anybody does have any questions that they would like to add, um, then please do pop those in the Q&A or in the chat if you've only got access. I'm going to have a quick look back through the chat myself. So we did have a question. What was the system mentioned on making accessing the help accessible? Um, I'm not sure if you're referencing there when I just said about offering different options of asking for help. Um, so it's not a specific system of such, but it's just making sure that you have um, lots of options to be able to ask for help. So um, like I said, whether they be uh, a web, an email, a telephone number, um, just available you just need to make sure you're offering those different options um, in case the fundamental accessibility problem is with the website you don't want to make make your feedback um, for help or options for asking help only available on your website um, Okay, uh, no, so I've just seen another question come through. Looking at your free sessions about disabilities, what kind of sessions are these? Are they interactive sessions for organisations or pre-recorded videos of individuals? So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, Oh, you've sent a link, Tash, so I'm just going to have a look at that. Uh, OK, so those are our sessions with Alex. So um, so those are our sessions run by Alex, Tash. I am going to be completely honest with you now and say I've not actually sat in on one of Alex's sessions, so I can't tell you exactly how he runs them. But likelihood is, is that they will be um, interactive sessions and um, they're unlikely to be pre-recorded I don't think um, but definitely your best option to do Tash is if you just reach out if it's something that you're interested in just reach out to the team um, they'll be able to have a chat with you about what we can offer what we can do for you um, and what's available in those so um, please do just yeah reach out to them on on that page that you linked through um, and have a chat with them about what they can do because there's lots of different options of things that we can um, we can offer but um, Alex will definitely be in a better position to give you information on those because I've not had the pleasure of sitting in on one of his sessions yet I must try and do that one time <laughs> okay um, I think I saw there was a question in the chat 
I'm just going to go up. Uh, what do you think about DWP's disability confidence scheme? Is it worth registering or promoting or is it really not that good? I can't comment specifically. I haven't had any involvement in um, in it specifically in our organisation or with them. But I think that anything that is advertising being disability confident is worth signing up for um, and having a go at because it it's not going to have a negative effect in any way. Um, I think it's definitely worth um, register, registering um, and having a go. And it is a good way to lead you into being um, a little bit more disability inclusive. So I would definitely recommend um, having a bit more of a look into it. Um, brilliant. Thank you so much for everybody's lovely comments in the chat. Um, I've stopped sharing my screen so I've lost the time. Oh, we've got a couple of minutes left. So if anybody else had anything else, I'm happy to stay for a couple of minutes. But otherwise, thank you all so much for listening and thank you for your nice comments in the chat. <laughs>